Welcome to Discover Indie Film. I'm your host, Jeff Howard, and I've got Matthew Lucas with me. Hey, Matthew. Hey, Jeff. And I might call him Matt for the rest of this. Although it's funny, my older brother's Matt, so we were Matt and Jeff my whole life. Here we go. Anyhow, uh, Matthew is here because his film Kringle Time was at Filmvasion in Los Angeles in 2021. And I got to say, I love it. It is a kick-ass, wonderfully... Everyone loves a dark Christmas movie, right? <laughs> sure. Who doesn't? Yeah. And Kringle Time is definitely a dark Christmas movie. It's hilarious. It's actually touching. I, I think it, it hit, hits all the bars for me. And so thank you for coming in and talking about it. We uh, Thank you for having me. We very often I have short filmmakers on here whose work is in the Discovery Indie Film TV series that's on Amazon Prime. All right, now that's all I'll mention it because we're talking <laughs> about Kringle Time, which is also on Amazon Prime. So... We might do spoilers. How do you feel about spoilers? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, I mean, the, the audience is... Uh, yeah, I mean, we can we can talk around a couple of key things, but, uh, but spoilers yeah. are fine. Yeah, yeah, audience tends to be other filmmakers, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, you should watch it. If you haven't seen Kringle Time, seriously, it's uh, right now, it's included with Prime. So if you go to Prime Video, search for Kringle with a K and Time with a T. I think that's all you I need got to it. say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and it's boom. on uh, it's on Apple TV and it's on Google Play and all the rest of the places too. For so, sure. Yeah. In fact, people should totally support an indie filmmaker and yeah. pay for it on Rent Apple. Rent it in each of those places. Yes, yeah, yeah. everywhere. <laughs> Have a budget it out. <laughs> but it really is great. And by the way, it is an award-winning film. Uh, took home the grand jury prize for best actor in a lead role for for Vernon Wells, who is excellent. But uh, of course, he's excellent because of your work. Oh no no no! We are we are each excellent in our in our own everyone, special ways. Everyone's excellent. <laughs> everyone in everyone involved in that film is excellent. All right. Well, this podcast, I always just ask the obvious starting question, which is, what got you into this crazy filmmaking racket? Um, what were your early inspirations? What what hooked you? Yeah, uh, it's a good question and it's a tough one. Um, I, I wouldn't say that I was like. Uh, you know, always interested in film in like a creation way. Always liked movies, obviously, but uh, but no, I think I was. I had a lot of interests when I was younger, and I'm you know I'm a musician. I was an actor for a long time when I was in you know high school, moving into college. I was doing a lot of writing. Um, always been kind of like a computer nerd, and I think eventually. Uh, after I studied theater in my undergrad and I was kind of like, you know, deciding what path I wanted to take after that. When I went back to grad school, I chose film just because it was sort of a, uh, a cross section of all those things. You know, I could, I could be a musician. I could be a writer. I could mess with computers. I can I mean, you know, play around with cameras and things that are techy and nerdy like that. Uh, it kind of felt like, okay, all, all these things I like, they're all in this one sort of art form. So that's, that's what I got, you know, when I got serious about it, but you know, in high school and college, I was making a lot of stupid videos with my friends, and we ran like the morning announcements in the high school and things like that. So it was always, always the bug was always there, um, but you didn't didn't seriously nurture it. I don't think until grad school. Until grad school, yeah. but but even before that, like as a kid, were you did you write stuff? Were you pursuing creativity? Kind yeah, of just general creativity. I re- yeah, I remember like I would write some like fan fiction with uh, with some of my friends for like video games and stuff like that. Uh, Hey, I had like a radio a, show that I made with like my my mom's karaoke machine. I remember that it was fun. Uh, there yeah. is a big difference between a kid who plays a lot of video games and one who plays video games and is inspired to create something <laughs> like in its universe. Like right, that's right, right. that's a very different mind, I think. Yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know. I would shudder to read any, anything that we wrote back then. <laughs> I bet it might kick ass. Honestly, there's there's something about that purity of that yeah, era. Yeah. That's so, true. I, you know, we talk about that a lot. And, you know, now with, um, you know, we, so in, in college, I made uh, like two feature length just pet projects. Like it was like one of those have the summer off, wake up one day and we're like, hey, what are you guys doing this weekend? You want to like shoot a feature film? It was like the kind of stupid mindset you could be in when you were younger. And uh, and it was so easy. Like it was I say easy with heavy quotation marks. It was like you didn't you didn't know enough to stop yourself from from doing something crazy like that. So you just did it. And like we, you know, those two movies that we made are terrible, right? You know, but they exist and we did them very quickly and we didn't really, we didn't stress out about them. They were fun, you know, and, and there was, there was a a purity to it that now, you know, I've been, I'm writing a script right now. I've been working on the outline for a year, you know, a year. (laughs) Did you do the edit and camera thing with that stuff? No, not quite that crazy, but, uh, but you know, we, we knew from learning the basics in high school, uh, 
you know, sort of how to put something together. So we, we had shot lists and storyboards and we edited it properly and things like that. But right. I mean, the, and by then, digital editing, uh, uh, offline editing had become a, enough of a thing. It was yeah, accessible. It was democratized enough at that point. I remember I learned in high school on the ner- whatever the, it was probably like CS2 version of, um, of Premiere. And, uh, and then, yeah, at some point, I think in college, I switched to Final Cut. But, I mean, at that point, even in, yeah, when I was in college, they were selling Final Cut, like, to students, like, the student discount version of, like, a light version of Final Cut. And, uh, yeah, no, the tools were, were there. Not quite to the extent they are nowadays, but, uh, but the tools were there. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. All right, so it was grad school. Grad school, it, it really when I, locked When in. I really, like, actually started studying film, yeah. And... Was that a grad school film program? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so it was it was at the application phase, or when you were deciding to go to grad school, you that yeah. you chose film. So you know, like I said, I had studied theater, and then when I finished undergrad, I just worked in uh, student financial aid, like in an office desk job for like four years, and then you know, after a certain period of doing work, like there's thankless work, by the way, these people uh, working in student financial aid are angels. I know it doesn't seem like that, uh, but they, you know, I've never worked a job since uh, where I sort of like all my colleagues cared so deeply about what they did. I know it's like the most annoying thing to have to do is like apply for student loans and all that stuff. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. After working in this field for, uh, you know, four years, it can be a little soul draining. And that when I, I was like, I'm not, I'm not writing enough. I'm not doing enough to apply my creative self. Right. And that was supposed to be your Kafka S job that allowed you to create it. Uh, yeah. And then, yeah. Cause, cause you can go, you probably did take, you don't, whatever it's. So I actually failed at one thing here, which is what part of the, what part of the country did you grow up in? Oh, I grew up near Pittsburgh, uh, about an hour North of Pittsburgh. Um, I went, did my undergrad in New York City, um, and uh, that's where I was when I was working in financial aid in New York. Lived there for like eight or nine years, and then I moved down to D.C. for another eight. That's where I went to grad school. Uh, now I'm here in L.A. Excellent. And I imagine financial aid is even more important with the cost of living in New York for, for students. And oh, yeah. That. Yeah, yeah. That can't be easy. <laughs> no. Dang. All right. So you've actually lived in major urban centers of this country, which is kind of yeah. cool. yeah. All right, so it was it wasn't until grad school that you like sat down and really hunkered down and started writing screenplays and whatnot. Well, yeah, I think I had probably written some shorts and things, and like I said, we had written a lot of things in uh, in uh, you know, high school and college. Um, and you know, I studied playwriting when I was in when I was in undergrad, so uh, I was pretty confident as a writer by the time I, I went into grad school. Um, but the process of writing film, at least the way I was sort of instructed at first, is is quite different uh, from writing a play. And, and so I was fortunate in undergrad to to sort of have an almost apprenticeship. I worked with one. It wasn't you know it wasn't intended that way. I just don't think there were many. <laughs> there was only one playwriting professor. So I ended up working with him through each level uh, there. So I really got his. <laughs> methodology i would say not so much like the broad playwriting methodology here's how i write plays that was that was his thing and it worked for me you know and and the process was sort of in brief it was something like to to get into you're you're not thinking about plot you're really only drawing up a character putting them in a place that you really identify with putting them across the table let's say from another character that you've just kind of dreamed up and not thinking about what they're going to do together what again, like what the plot, what the actual story of it's going to be. Just put them into place, and then get into a, like a Zen mindset, and then just listen and transcribe, 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 transcribe. That was a sort of methodology. Um, not cre- not create. You're not like putting words in these people's mouths. They already have the words. You're just listening to them. And it was a kind of a tr- like a hippy dippy, you know, way to write a little bit. It felt like because you have to you have to sort of meditate to to get into that headspace, and then you have to be like really trusting that you'll find what the plot is after you write enough. And the first 30 pages of dialogue you're writing could be garbage, but eventually you'll find, oh, okay, that's what this play is about. Totally different approach to writing a film, at least the way I was taught, which is a lot more, and the literature surrounding how to write a movie is much more dogmatic when it comes to, like, it starts this way. It's on, on page story five, structure. the theme is stated, and blah, blah, and all this stuff. And so it's much, now I outline to death 
you know, I just said I've worked for a year on the outline for this script. I mean, not kidding. For a year, I've been beatboarding. But with that, with thing. the other method, also sounded like a lot of character work, like making yeah. sure you had defined <laughs> characters who could then have conversations with each other in your on the page in your right. mind. And so, if you apply, if you work, get your outline done, you can shift back to that mode, right? And then let people. You can. You can. I just think that um, it, writing for film and by design, you know. Uh, is more there are clearer walls you know in theater i just think you can do a character you can, nothing can happen in a play and it can be the most riveting thing you've ever seen because you go to the theater for a visceral contact with another human being whose spit is flying on your forehead while you're sitting next to a perfect stranger laughing in the dark at this thing it's a it's a thing that we don't have in film we don't have that same like literal human connection right and so in place of that in film, I think you have just a more st- structured and, and uh, uh, finessable sort of um, set of rules that you have to, I don't know. I don't think you have to adhere to them, but generally we do. Right. <laughs> Not every movie that you see has like the traditional three act structure, obviously, but I mean, there's a reason it works. Yeah. I mean, we're tiptoeing around a conversation that we're not going to let ourselves have yeah. about, <laughs> about what it's like to watch a film where the characters take over and yeah. you're just blown away by performance. Like right. if you don't have great performances, which is funny because that's kind of one of the things going on with the Oscars this year, I think, is that performance pieces with almost no story like got nominated and everyone's like that movie's boring and i'm like actually <laughs> yeah no there are obviously layers and i mean like yeah, yeah it's it's easy to look at movie, like classic like uh, like my dinner with andre like you know this is a it, but but if you walk out of that movie you're 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 pro- one word you might be using to describe it would be it was kind of theatrical wasn't it right because it really is, you could almost see it as a play and so, like, that's the other thing that there that Venn diagram of theater and film, where it overlaps, I feel like there's a lot of temptation to sort of be like, well, if it works on the stage, a couple of tweaks will make it work on film. It might be the case, you know, here and there. But for the most part, I would say that you know, as much as I love my dinner with Andre, it's not it's not like inherently cinematic, you know. It is the way it was executed. You know, they improvised like some like 10, 20 different discussions or whatever and then like wrote it from their improvisations and then pieced together a script for it. And that had to make this scripted conversation feel like an authentic one. So a lot, a lot of layers that were only really that process could only have worked on film. So I don't want to say it was like not a good film exercise, but, you know, it's like Tarantino choosing to use 70 millimeter film to shoot. The Hateful Eight when it's going to be mostly inside and mostly like a claustrophobic theater piece. It's like you you have a tool here and you have the ability to use it in a purely cinematic way. You're not always using those tools very efficiently. Yeah. And it sounds like as someone with a theatrical background who then started looking at cinema and, and the ca- how to capture that stuff on camera, you're very aware of these things because like my dinner with Andre, in a lot of ways... I don't want to call it a stunt, but it's almost like it was their way of saying, you know what? Like Louis Mall and, and those two actors and writers. I mean, they're both play writers. They're both amazing yeah, yeah. people, like amazing minds. It was like, let's just go to the extreme and just have a conversation movie. And like, it's almost like the single shot film. Like, OK, we can do a single shot. Let's like, right, it's gimmick. a little bit of yeah. a let's let's just fucking do the max. Yeah, yeah. Take it to the max, yeah. which actually kind of makes it punk rock. And yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so as someone with. With these perspectives, has that sort of been a thing for you all through, like even grad school and everything, like balancing your desire for something theatrical and something cinematic? Yeah. Um, it's and, always in my mind like that creating more interesting characters for me comes from getting into that place where you don't make, you know, maybe you can picture the character, maybe you can see what they're wearing, maybe you can hear that they have a lisp or there's something specific, right? But you don't really know who they are. And then just throwing them into a situation and finding out who they are. That is a way more interesting way to design characters I have found than in uh, than in writing for film where you have a plot that you're like, well, okay, this plot needs this type of a person here. And so here's the, here's the puzzle piece that was already formed for me and now I'm putting it in there. So you, you almost already know too much about the character by the time if you've outlined it first. Um, but no, I, I would say that I try to balance, like sometimes if I'm stuck in one vein, you know, I'll go back to my playwriting brain and, and I'll, and I'll borrow some, some tools out of that kit. 
Yeah, but it's I mean, always a balancing act. Yeah, I don't yeah. want to jump into Kringle too early because I assume a whole lot happened in your life before you <laughs> got got from grad school to Kringle. But I mean, that's a very performative film. It's yeah, very, right. very. I mean, because it's set uh, in a TV stu- uh, in a studio, then that is old fashioned TV. Kids TV was really just shooting live theater for sure. Yeah, yeah. So interesting now to know oh, that, yeah. like you were yeah. drawn to this right. script that had. Really, the warring things are in the script you, you chose. But yeah. And the guy I wrote the movie with um, also comes from a theater background. So I think we were both sort of drawn to that kind of like small town theater troupe, uh, you know, especially like the two sort of co-hosts of Kringle Time. They're these kind of like kids who think they're bigger than their boots actually are kind of a thing. And uh, but they live in this small town, so they don't have that perspective to know that they're really not the best, right? But they think they are, and that's a really cool. Plus, early on, we talked about a movie, uh, Waiting for Guffman. I don't know if you know this Christopher Christopher Guest movie. Um, that was like a huge inspiration for like the vibe, if you will, of Kringle Time. And yeah, that like that just like same thing, like that small town. We we care about this little show so much that like the town is involved in the success of this show. You know, that's a it's a specific and. Yeah, I would say that it comes for sure from my small town background a little bit and uh, and uh, my theater background as well. Yeah. All right. So I, I don't want to jump too far ahead. So so what was going on in grad school? Great experience. The uh, was it a mix of uh, like film theory and practical or was it mostly practical? What were it was a pretty open program in terms of being able Wait, to and you sh- said dc but you didn't say what school uh, the american school? university of washington dc yeah all right yeah and one of only two film mfas in the dc area the other one being at howard uh, which is another great program but uh yeah yeah I, I i would say that at the time i was a little iffy on the structure of the program because i felt like it should have been guided just a little bit more but that di- that feeling didn't last too long because what I eventually discovered was that um, it, it's it's a it's a malleable uh, atmosphere grad school and you you know it's still a little bit cliche but you know you you make the best of it you know, like if you if you don't put the effort in you don't get the reward you know that, that you're looking for and so once I once I sort of learned to be like oh okay no one's gonna like tell me what to do here so uh, here we go and then I sort of formed my own set of goals for for the masters which included like a proof of concept short film for a feature that I had written. And then I was also interested in game design. So I hired like a small uh, indie game studio basically to design like a, a game, like a, like a, an iOS game that tied into the world of my short film. Uh, so that was my, my whole big project for those several years was like just figuring, figuring out how to put those people together right. to make an interesting sort of package. Yeah. Uh, a multimedia, multi-platform yeah. Yeah, yeah. concept. That's very cool. It's fun. Yeah. yeah, you're ambitious. You got ambitions. Uh, stupid, maybe. Yeah. Well, <laughs> thank God for the people who don't hold back from <laughs> from the things that other people think are too foolish to try. All right, so you made that short. Made the short, yeah. And uh, good experience. Yeah, learned a lot. I mean, I think um, it, it's you know. It, you, a lot of a lot of people in that program didn't, you know, did, they, they, you, you didn't have to make a short film. A lot of people are like, oh, it's my thesis film. That's what I did. That's what a lot of people do. Some people wrote scripts and some people designed course, you know, courses because, you know, if MFA is like kind of geared toward teaching one day anyway, so you can kind of focus on that a little bit. So, again, I, th- again, I want to say that I think that was the really cool thing about the experience is that it was moldable and, you know, whoever you were, as long as you could identify that, you could you could take that path. Um so yeah, but with the with the film, I, I think it was, you know, the program itself would also to, to maybe more directly answer your question, it would oscillate between being theory focused and practicality. So there was a little bit of both, and uh, you could sort of choose which path you wanted to go down. Um, and in the end, I think that you can only speak in theory for so long. You can only take those the the classes that are sort of geared toward giving you practical filmmaking knowledge for so long. You can learn a lot in those settings, but you can't actually cross the finish line until you get your boots on the ground and, and like come this close to, <laughs> to failing entirely every single day, you know? And so that was, um, we, we prepped pretty well for moonshot is the name of this film that, uh, that I made before Kringle time. It's also on Amazon. Uh, 
And it's like it was sci-fi, like a throwback 80s sci-fi action movie type of thing. I had a lot, and this is one thing I like to do with my projects is like, here's something I've never done. Can I do it? Question mark. And then try to do it, you know. And so for this one, it was a fight scene. I was, I've never done like a hand-to-hand combat scene. They look cool. They entertain me. I want to see if I can do it. And so really, I wrote this short proof of concept thing around the idea that, well, I know one thing about it. There's a fight scene toward the end of the movie. And then I built the story out kind of like from there. But it was a great experience. I, I got learned a lot. You know, you, you fail in some ways. You succeed in others. And I think I took a lot of, uh, of what we did there including a lot of the crew, <laughs> and ended up using them for Kringle Time. Right. So you, yeah. you were forming community or, for sure. or I mean, uh, ensemble or whatever yeah. the term would be. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of talk about, you know, when you find people that you like working with, then if, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of a thing. That definitely bore out in, uh, in on Moonshot. You know, um, everyone was in it. Uh, under weird conditions in like an abandoned warehouse in the middle of nowhere in Virginia. Uh, it wasn't super pleasant, you know, um, but we all banded together for that. And I think you make, you, you really, you find out who you are in those situations. You find out kind of who your, who, who your friends are too. And uh, a, yeah, a huge percentage of those people came, were, were asked back without a second thought uh, for the feature. For sure. In fact, now I've, I have reached that point of middle age where my memory is, uh, kicks in a little late <laughs> but now i remember why i know about this community you were in because lonnie martin yes yeah lonnie martin was in was in that community with you and he worked we, on your film yeah we went to grad school together that's where you guys we went. went to grad school together yeah. for those who don't lonnie martin made a kick-ass film that won an award at our festival i think 2018 or 19 that sounds right uh, last of the Manson 18 girls 18 or 19 yeah which people should check out too right so you were part of a, a really cool creative you know, I think I I think you have an advantage in a lot of ways over people who came to L.A. right after finishing that MFA and and like because that community there, it sounded like it's it's more nurturing and more well-rounded and you can try more things and people willing to. I mean, obviously, you can have that here, but it sounds like you had something really special out in D.C. Yeah. You know what? I think part of it is. um you know, and we, and we all worked, you know, professionally in the area as in addition to doing these like little passion projects. And the work in the D.C. area is a lot of, um, you know, government and military contract work. You know, it's, it's right. So you were, do, you were doing industrial films for, yeah. for money. Exactly. And um, that's also where a big part of the community that ended up helping with Kringle Time came from as well. But I think as a result of the, the work not, and, you know, features do come through D.C., but not. Not with any like meaningful frequency. Um, yeah, they just do an exterior of the Capitol yeah, building yeah, with their yeah, with yeah. their with right. their uh, whatever. Or they like be. blow up a mall. I think uh, I think Wonder Woman like there's an old abandoned mall in Northern Virginia. I think they uh, filmed a huge part of the '80s mall sequence in in. Uh, That's in right. There. Was it you or Lonnie who like lo- had like line producers jump onto that project? Well, we had uh, our gaffer on this was meant to work on Wonder Woman 84 and then left that project to gaff this one. So that was uh, huge, huge of her. Fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But because there's uh, the the, the work there can be a little dry, you know, Um, when someone when someone in the group pipes up and is like, hey, I want to make like a horror movie. Anybody want to, you know, what are you doing next weekend? You're like finally something to like keep me awake for sure. And for some yeah. reason, I want to mention like the the industrial the the gig work you're doing. You're still training skills, and you're still probably picking oh, things sure. up. No, it's, no. it's it's yes. a value. Yeah, I don't I don't mean to minimize it too much. I, I there's a lot of value in that work, like you say. Um, I mean, it beats the to, shit out of being one of those people who never leaves home and keeps perfecting scripts. You know, <laughs> I mean, I mean, getting out and doing stuff. It does work the muscle. It does. It does do that. So even when you're not working on stuff that um, that you like, you know, uh, I, I always still try to keep in mind, like, well, if I didn't, if I wasn't doing this, I would be forgetting it. You know, I'd be forgetting how to do all this stuff. Yeah, the muscles get weak. I mean, I almost feel like saying that even when you're working on your own work, there are things you don't like that you have to do. Like practicing doing the things you don't yeah, want to yeah. do is. Maybe it's just because I have a 14-year-old in the house. I'm very (laughs) focused on, like, people should be willing to do shit they don't want to do. Right, right, right. But it is. It is important. For sure. Especially with the film. So Kringle Time was the 
first thing you did after uh, Moonshot? Yeah. Did I have another? Or was yeah, that another I short the first name? thing I, pro- I wrote? I, I write a lot, um, but I think that's the first thing I produced after. Yeah. So right. Moonshot so, was so 2016, and we, we went into production on um, Kringle Time in 2018. So, yeah. And Kringle, like, the idea came up, and uh, and you and, and what, Zang? Zang, Zang yeah. Mm-hmm. Zang, like... And you, it popped up, and you just looked at it on paper and said, "I got to make this happen." Well, we wrote it. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, like we. You mean like how did we get into the idea? Yeah, like the well, idea after you it? wrote it, like because yeah. obviously you've written a bunch of things. Oh, I see. We we wrote it specifically for making it. So so that that's the, that's the kind of interesting. It almost was to a prompt. So like, you know, both of us we both you know had worked in. Um, film and tv in in the dc area we both had uh, both writers and you know at a certain point we just kind of uh you get bored you're you're just like all right it's time to do something different i can't like stay still right now so we both got together and we're like all right we want to make a feature that's we've committed to that how do we do that question mark right and uh and we we looked at a couple scripts that each of us had lying around the scripts that i think both of us write independently um you know we're not writing for producing we're just writing uh, this is a fun story i just want to i don't care how much it costs here we go this is the story and so when we read all those scripts with the eye for production we were kind of like okay there's one of these that's like almost small enough meaning it's not set on saturn right you know while it's exploding uh this one is actual human people set here on earth in modern times that's something we might be able to do but the scope of it was like just too big like it was just too too many locations, too many people, too many this, too many that, whatever. Right, right. Because you had done enough work that your producer brain could kick in. Yeah, and, right. And, and just... You know what you can succeed at and what and what you can't. Yeah, right? what's too expensive. Yeah. 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 And I'm a big believer in not trying to out-hit your coverage. You know, I think, like, uh, if, if you're going to do something that's kind of high concept, you better tr- figure out a way to put enough barriers in front of yourself that you're not going to, like, try to do this really cool thing and only have the money or the skill to get halfway there it's it'll end up backfiring in a way that won't you know it's not going to look cool it's going to take people out of the story whatever it is if it distracts from what you're trying to the story you're trying to tell it's not worth even trying so like if you have to put restrictions on yourself because you're because you just don't have the money or you don't have the time or whatever that's fine admit that you have those barriers and put them there and then you can play really well within that smaller you know sort of sandbox um anyway we got to a point with uh, all this stuff where we looked at what we had and we were like well, none of this can work so i guess let's just try to write something so we you know beat out the story together and then i gave it to him because i didn't i wanted to try to separate my writer brain from my director brain i was like you you do this you do it well i'll try to do my thing well and then we won't have to right so so you generated the generate it and then you said to him okay so so that i can come to it as a director yeah you said have him complete yeah. the script which makes that that's actually very uh that's that shows some foresight. Well, yeah, I mean, like, uh, like I said about you know, you, and we all know, you learn by doing, right? And, and I think uh, you learn by screwing up. So you know, uh, you it only t- if you're if if you're self aware enough, I think, uh, and it really only takes screwing up badly one time for you to be like, well, not doing that again. So, and I've always had a sort of, um, I won't say it's not done successfully, but I've always thought it was a little weird when. Like a writer acts in his own thing, for example. I feel like one of those two jobs has to suffer. And I don't know if it's just because doing one of those for me, you know, nearly <laughs> kills me. You know, it's like it takes all my brain power to focus on one job. And so the more jobs you keep adding, I feel like the more you dilute the water a little bit. I don't know. I've always felt like kind of weird about that. I think I think you're on to something. And I mean, I'm sure everyone can come up with anecdotes of where it's okay. It does work. But yeah. it only works if that person... Like Woody Allen can, works as a director, actor, but I think it's because he doesn't care about the production. He doesn't do multiple takes. He'll do it, you know, he, he lives with mistakes. He wants to work a six-hour day. He doesn't want to, like, stay there and nitpick every detail. It's funny because I was going to say you need the person to have a... Uh, an ego that's under control, and I'm not sure his is. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but I'm also, I've, 
I'm just going to throw a dig at him. Why not? He's, he's not. A, he's not <laughs> he's an easy he's, target. We'll punch he, him in while he's, he's down. He's a bit of a target <laughs> nowadays. Oh, I don't mean to jump in, but but uh, you know, when uh, every script you write, every character has the same voice. It's not that hard to jump in, and because it's his voice. Like he's writing. He's writing his own stand-up routine that he just does on film. I mean, I mean, I a lot of the films I loved. I mean. But I, I watched John Cusack do a Woody Allen imitation in Bullets Over Broadway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, exactly. Like, it yep. is what it is. But, <laughs> but yeah, you're. I, I get you. And and honestly, the more minds you bring to something, then you know the more there is value to human collaboration in this medium for sure. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. so so stepping away from the writing and becoming solely director and not and Lord knows directing when you're on camera too. I mean. My goodness. Yes. Yeah. No, I think it's just, and, and not that the writer can't be the director. And I mean, uh, of course, God knows I've done that as well. Um, I, I do think, though, it, it it runs the risk. I'm not saying that you can't rise above it, but like it, it does run the risk, at least for me, on set. I'm too, like I'm having, I'm reading the script that I wrote, right? And I'm, I'm flashing back to the moment I first envisioned it and wrote it on this page. And that can be too limiting when you're, you know, you know, you have again. You have to have those barriers. You have to have that that, that sort of predefined playground. And it's nice to have made a lot of decisions before you get there, including like, yeah, I wrote the script, so I made this decision. It's on the page, blah blah blah. But sometimes you need to be like, as a director, pretty open to the actor not reading it the way that you wanted to, or or bringing a really cool new reading that gives you a new idea about how this scene should go and how the power dynamic maybe should play between the two characters on screen. And if you're too committed as the writer. You know, to your early ideas, then then maybe you know it, at least at least it risks uh, you not being able to sort of adapt in that moment. Well, it really is just about understanding yourself. I mean, you probably could direct your own work and say, "I'm not going to be precious about the script," and consciously yeah. not be precious right. about it. But yeah, but there is that natural instinct. You know, uh, screenwriting they joke is killing your kids, right? Mm-hmm. Because yeah. you, you you give birth to it and then you just start slicing away. And yeah, and then directing that script is the same thing, and then the edit is the same thing. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot of murder, a lot of baby murder going on. It's it's uh, <laughs> it's it is interesting. But that's one of the things I love about indie film is that the creatives, at least, are killing their own kids based on their own decisions instead right. of <laughs> instead of being uh, forced to uh, kill instead them. of yeah, like yeah. three people who are just trying to justify their jobs, yeah, demanding yeah. changes. Right. I don't know. I'm being cynical. No, you're right. I'm 100% right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I will almost repeat a joke I've told before, but I won't. All right, so Kringle sounds like it was a because you had all the, a community in place and, and Zan to collaborate with, sounds like it was a fairly efficient process. And you had your lead actor in mind the whole time? Yeah, Benny, um, who we'd worked with on Moonshot, um, was fantastic. We knew that we wanted to collaborate with him again. Um, we had talked to him loosely to, over the pretty much since since I've known him. Uh, we've been talking about how to put something together that works for both of us. And then, like it's fortunate that as a as a writer and Zan as a writer as well, and then Benny as a performer, we all share a very similar sort of sarcastic tone. You know, so it, it's very easy to 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 write for. Benny, right? Uh, because we were probably going to write that way anyway. So we've included him pretty early in like in those talks, and we asked him like, you know, we wanted it to be something that he could use for his career. He was on Broadway at the time, and uh, and he does a lot of guest spots on TV shows and things like that. And um, you know, it, it would it was his first starring feature role, so it's like you know, it's a big deal for all of us involved. It's kind of like this is a big you know big risk and it's a big experiment. Um, and we want to make sure that all of us are feeling good about it when we head into it. Because if any one of us is feeling like, I don't know, man, my heart's not in it, then that that just wasn't going to work. So we want to make sure from the beginning we were all kind of on the same page. And Benny was a really good early collaborator. But yeah, you're right. It was it was a lot of um, putting all the pieces of what you what's around you on the table and being like, all right. What can we write that has, you know, a snowman mascot costume in it? What can we write that has Benny? What can we write that has a TV station that we have access to? So it, we just looked at those, like, givens, and then we made a uh, prompt. About For it. sure. Yeah. And, yeah, and you looked at Benny, and you, and you obviously, I mean, he does an amazing job 
I mean, he's on screen, I think, every moment of the film. Yeah, nearly. he's maybe in not in exactly one scene, I think. Yeah, yeah. one scene. <laughs> one scene. It's probably not a very long one. No, it's like the one I'm thinking of is when the mayor uh, comes to the um, statue in the morning, whistling Dixie, and finds that the that it's been beheaded in the night. It's like it's literally two shots, and it's just Jeff yeah. walking up to the to the uh, <laughs> to the statue, seeing it's beheaded, and walking away. Yeah, and so then it's and then it's back. The rest to, is Benny. Yeah. Yeah, back to Benny. <laughs> and and seriously, I mean, talk about talk about. Um, I don't even know how to say it, whether it's a risk or this or that. I mean, yeah, you were you were handing everything. This script was all about that lead character. I oh mean, yeah, mm-hmm. it is that character's journey, really. Yeah, um, and in multiple ways. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, to to me, one of the kind of through lines of Kringle Time is that is the idea of like you know achieving your childhood dreams and then questioning whether the pursuit was even worth it in the end. You know, and uh, so the the movie is the pursuit. You know, it's the there's a bit of you know that early in the in the early part, it's kind of like he's in the right place at the right time kind of a situation. He doesn't know that he's being taken taken advantage of by Herb, the guy who died. Um, so it kind of seems like all roses for him, but then like it it very quickly I think becomes like well the town is against me I'm being haunted by the ghost literally of the guy who played this before nothing's working out you know so it very much is about his journey and I, and I mean at the end I mean I don't know he, I, don't, I don't the journey's not over <laughs> for him and it ends a bit it's a bit of a he can have a scorched earth policy I would say Jerry adopts toward the end where he's just like let me burn this whole thing to the ground. And then we'll see where where this takes me. And that's going to be, I'm going to be in a better situation now that I've done that. Yeah. And was that something that appealed to you and Zan? Like you wanted to, I don't know. You mean like a downer ending? No, not a downer ending, but but, uh, I don't know, something a little bold, a little different, right? You're making an indie film. You might as well. I mean, I'm sure way too many people mention Bad Santa to you because (laughs) it's another Christmas thing where, where, you know, the ugly side of humanity is brought out around this, yeah, ta- around Christmas. And yours isn't necessarily. We discuss whether or not it's a Christmas yeah, movie, right? It's, right? it's funny at, the, at, at it a bar um, yeah. because it's really not a Christmas movie. No, no, it has a snowman in it, and it wasn't until we. I remember we talked very early on, like when we. Because the idea of the snowman wasn't even a given at first. It was we just were looking at. We knew we wanted to do like a children's mascot character, but then we were just looking for a combination of what's the cheapest one we can buy five of because we need to like burn three of them, uh, or and, and and or what's like the funniest one. So that that was like the the prompt for that, and uh, and the snowman ended up winning. But I mean, like it could yeah, have been a tiger. Could have been could have been anything. Yeah, it's funny how those... But then once it became a snowman, it sort of adds... It's interesting. It, it adds the... By default, it adds the Christmas element. And then, yeah, like we, early and on, just we talked about Kringle, like... When you named it Kringle. Yeah, well, yeah. And we... I think originally we had like a subplot in there where the, the backstory of it, which doesn't get told, is that... In fact, it's in a deleted scene. Um, but the, uh, the history of the show is something like they made a Christmas special one year. It was not, it never intended to be a repeating show, but then they got funding for it and decided they were too lazy to change it. So it just always remained a perpetual Christmas show every week for decades. <laughs> I mean, not to overstep, but I kind of think like it's a great idea. Like, like kids do love snowmen. So, so what you only have them in certain parts of the world for, certain a few months a year yeah. or i guess there's some places where it's snowy longer but like well i mean even in the show i don't know it's it's pretty subtle but i mean like he's a cowboy snowman so like his and his he's set in the desert i don't know if like even when you see him on there it's like a desert landscape with like a little bit of snow so it's like it's funny i barely i barely <laughs> yeah, picture the world outside because because yeah. the world of the of the tv station is really the uh yeah, yeah. it's really the the universe it occupies for sure yeah all right so you have this team together, good experience shooting it, good experience with all that? Yeah, very. in the end, very good. I think, um, you know, in the moment when you're doing stuff like that, you know, there are long days. Uh, obviously, you're oh, strapped features for are cash. A bitch. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> is that a fair term? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and much more so when the machine running it is not there aren't too many people operating that machine, you know? So we were talking earlier about having to separate roles in order to do each one to the best of your ability, right? You can try to do that. But I mean, if you don't have the money to 
have to pay people to do the things that you don't want to be doing so that you can focus on directing, for example. You, you just you just have to do all those things. You have to do the SAG paperwork when people show up for the day. You have to, you somebody has to do it, right? So if it's it's not me, it's the other guy co producing this thing and Sometimes, you know, you get help when you need it. Absolutely. I want to give credit where it's due. Lonnie was my AD. He took a lot of weight off of my shoulders when it was very much appreciated. Um, and the team was good. Uh, but, I mean, you, the truth remains that, like, it's a very, very low-budget movie. Not enough people, not enough time, not enough anything. Yeah. So thankfully, you and, thankfully <laughs> you and Zan collaborated and, like, because, like, you were both listed, right? You and Zan are listed as producers. So it's like, yeah, yeah. it's like. This film had two parents. Yes, it's absolutely. always rough when there's only one parent That's because then you're tough. a single yeah. parent, and yeah. it's really having Zan to lean on throughout. I mean, because it's everything, and once it wraps, and you're exhausted, and you need to go to sleep forever, you still have to file taxes for the company. You still have to do yeah, everything. It's it, it's. Uh, oh, you're mentioning yeah. taxes at the end of February. <laughs> 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 but uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And then, uh, did you do the edit? I ended up doing it. It wasn't the yeah. plan, uh, like like everything else. Uh, I we had an editor on board, and they worked for uh, Disney, and I think it was right around the launch of Disney Plus, so they got busy with that um, to a, to a point where they had to. It was it was it was an amicable sort of breakup. It was you know he he came to me and said uh, you yeah. know I don't have the bandwidth to do it and uh, sorry, and I was intended to replace. Um, the editor, but I ended up tinkering in the interim as I was kind of like looking. And then I, I eventually got so close where I was like, okay, well I could hire somebody or I could just like do a couple test screenings with people and finish this out myself, which is what I ended up doing. And, and, and if you put on your producer's brain, that was more financially advantageous. Absolutely. Right? I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were, we were way out of money by that point anyway. So it's, we didn't have a ton of options for where to go with the edit, but uh, yeah. <laughs> For sure. And and I have to assume that, uh, yeah, I mean, showing it to friends. It is interesting because I used to be, uh, as a fan of film, once I shifted into just watching, I used to really be against directors doing the edit. I'm and, against it too. Yeah. All right, but but I keep <laughs> seeing examples that work out. Yeah. You know? So, so I think I, the Coens edit their own stuff. They use a pseudonym, I think. But they, oh, that's I'm interesting. pretty sure the Coens do. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it can be done. I mean, you just the thing is, it's another skill. And, and, you know, it's like, um, you know, I've done a lot of editing. So I think I I I don't I don't think I'm a fantastic editor, but I think I can edit. But it's another one where I think you just have to look at, you know, what what can you do? I think if I legitimately knew I could not edit, you know, just didn't wasn't a skill that I had. um, I would have found a way to bring. Right. If you didn't have the technical skills. But once you have the technical skills, it's really did you have any breakaway for like, did you do like a, a, a three month? Three month off kind of deal, and then come back to it with fresh eyes. Well, yeah, or, or I was three pretty. Weeks. I was pretty bombed after the production. You know, going through it under such tight constraints, definitely my stress management could have been better, <laughs> maybe. So it took me a long time to recover. Um, several months, I would say six months off. I took six months like off entirely. Oh, that's that's actually yeah, yeah. fantastic. Yeah. That's ended up being. That's good. what I was fishing yeah. for. Yeah, <laughs> ended up being good. When I came back to it, it was still pretty slow going because then we then we lost the editor. Then got busy with work because I had taken so much time off of work that I needed to like work more. So right, you need to like food yeah. and food you and need rent. To, to eat. Yeah. Right. Uh, as it turns out. But, um, but yeah. And then like by the time I finally got back into focusing on it, it wasn't until the pandemic hit the pandemic hit. And all of a sudden I had all this time. I was like, all right, well let's just finish this thing up <laughs> for sure. And, and that time off, quickly. I mean, that's a huge difference. Yes. Yeah having that much time away from it and then going to the edit versus yeah. like if you had started assembling it <laughs> three weeks after after you wrapped yeah not enough then, distance. then you would have yeah. had yeah then you're in the middle of the forest and you don't know which way to go exactly exactly yeah oh excellent cool and then uh so this is another i can't name how many but a lot of films got completed uh, because COVID hit, and all of a sudden, people turned and looked at their looked at their lives and said, "Well, shit! I all those things you had time never had time for. Now you did." For sure. I I mean, uh, I won't diminish the psychological toll that the pandemic has had on me and a lot of people I know. Um, t- tough times for sure. But uh, I would say that one of the lifelines I had was was being able to work on stuff being able to finish this up I, I wrote a play that I had like been, been in the back of my mind for years I finally finished that 
um, working on this new script now. Um, so, you know, been trying to, it's kind of <laughs> to stave off the demons. I think sometimes you have to make your brain busy. And so for sure, for sure. All right. So, uh, you're locked down, um, with your lovely wife, I assume. Oh yeah. And, uh, which is nice. The big difference between being locked down alone and being locked down with a partner. And yes. especially if you like your partner, that was nice. Yes. Yeah. That was liking, nice. yeah liking your partner is always we, good. We, yeah. uh, found out how many people didn't actually <laughs> like it. <That's> true. <laughs> yeah. There was enough of it's that like, as well. I could handle that person yeah. from like dinner to bedtime, <laughs> but the other 16 hours a day was rough. But uh, so you and you were able to use the Internet and stuff to like show it to friends and stuff. You didn't have to have people because like there was it was like a weird time. Was it a weird time to be completing a film when you would normally yeah. like want to have like a dozen people in your living room and show yeah, them, yeah, yeah. Show them a, a, an edit? Even through like the I had always wanted to do like a private premiere for the cast and crew. Um you know, before the world exploded. And I was hoping to wait it out, wait it out, wait it out. You know, never ended. Uh, so eventually we just did our premiere. Like I used like an online service that was basically at 8 p.m. It starts, you know. And uh, so even the premiere, like I had, I had my wife and I think I had two friends over, you know. And this was uh, just before vaccine time, really. So it was like, I think we had, you know, we had like our little bubble where it's like, we're the four of us, we're, our, we're the bubble, no one outside of that. If anyone else sees anybody in the world, just tell the rest of the group and you isolate. It was like crazy. So we had to plan for this pr- the premiere of Kringle Time sitting with just the four sure. of us in this room. And you were still in D.C., so. No, no, I was, I was oh, here. Oh, you moved down here. in L.A. by then. Yeah. I moved down to L.A. Yeah. So I'm just going to be selfish and ask. So Film Invasion Los Angeles, you submit to. Probably first month or two of 2021. Yeah. Sure. Right? Somewhere and around then, uh, end of 2020. And then we were really hoping to be in the theater in yeah. June. <laughs> <laughs> and I forgot. Oh, it was so close. It was so close. Cause yeah, you were right on the line, right? Because, I mean, like like two weeks, I think, after the event, the like things started opening two up. Two weeks later, they yeah. started changing the rules about theaters. But uh, that was, was, you know, what can I say? Yeah. Uh, not to get political, but... You know, when, when we stopped accepting our submission stop, I think, on March 15th, and then the festival's three months later in June, and it was like, hey, everyone will be vaccinated by June. Motherfucker, didn't happen, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> even even in L.A., um, so it was uh, it was tough. So so you had, uh, so you did an online premiere for, for yeah. your peeps and cast and crew, and then... Just went ahead and just did a festival, uh, a festival run that was mostly virtual. Or by the time we had even done that um, virtual premiere, we had already approached a sales agent for soliciting the movie to distributors because, um, you know, as 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 many good things came out of uh, having the pandemic to finish, you know, a movie and and, and dedicate the time that I needed to it. Um, there were also some negative things, which was just that, the, as you know, the, the festival circuit was so badly disrupted that we didn't know, legitimately didn't know, what the value of participating in a bunch of virtual festivals was. Um, because it robs you of, like, especially at the low, mid-tier festivals, like, the, the advantage of doing those isn't so much screening the movie even it the advantage is getting to mingle with the with people who are doing the same kinds of things that you're doing and meeting interesting creators and artists and being able to have that sort of connection and um i i go to the austin film festival every year and i remember when the i guess in 2020 when they did their virtual version of the festival <clears throat> you know we go and we do the conference there every year and uh they did a virtual version of it where yeah you get to basically do a webinar you know throughout the day like a series of webinars but you don't get to you know the per- oh uh, the person who asked a question at that panel they seemed pretty cool let me find them at the bar afterward like that's a that's the lifeblood of, of, what, of what we're doing at festivals and uh and it was totally, totally different experience. And you know, not to uh, dig on Austin too much, an incredible organization. Um, they did a great job, like with with what we had. You know, it was just like, and, and everyone so you did it too, and everyone who yeah, still I mean, they had did events. that. Other places just <clears throat> yeah. did nothing. Yes, well, they, that's, they, they that's sent out they sent out laurels and gave yeah. some awards and said there will be no interaction yeah. whatsoever. Yeah, it's it was bad. Like that that situation was really sad for us because we had this movie. 
you know, we worked so hard on it and then we just like kind of wanted to get out there and bring us the, you know, the connection with other people that we'd hoped it would. And, um, so yeah, we eventually walked away from the traditional festival strategy and we were just like, let's just solicit directly to distributors here. Maybe that'll get us the end game that we're looking for. And then, um, unfortunately we just don't know how long to wait out. You know, is this going to be one more season? Is it going to be two, three, four, you know, is this forever now? <laughs> so we just kind of, we we're like, we can't sit on this forever. Here we go. So it, I, I would say that's one. It's, it's, it, I, we all went through craziness during the pandemic, so it's hard to complain like, oh, my movie didn't get to play at a festival. <laughs> That's a tough hill to die on there. But it, it, it is something that the pandemic robbed, I think, from the experience of making this movie was was being able to use it to, yeah, to, to connect, uh, basically, with the community. Connect to the community yeah. and, and share it. Yeah, there's yeah. something really, I hope you're the kind of person who can sit in a theater and watch his film and instead of cringing nonstop at all the things you want to be different, you can enjoy it with mm-hmm. an audience. I don't, I don't know if we're quite there yet, Jeff. You're not, you may <laughs> not be there. Fair enough. Well, you should, because it's, it's I, pretty, with, it's with pretty damn time fun. Off, I remember I recently went back to my short film, Moonshine. Everything I do, I kind of like, you know, I'm obsessed with it when I do it, and once it's done, I'm happy for other people to enjoy it. I don't need to participate in it as closely anymore. But Moonshot, I went back to recently, and... Um, and I, you know, I'm laughing at my own stupid jokes. I mean, that's always it's always a good thing. And I'm uh, giving Matt a thumbs yeah. up because uh, <laughs> what can I say? As, as, a, as an admirer of, of people's work, <laughs> yeah, I have to say, I understand that being hard on yourself makes the next thing better. But uh, you should be proud of this film. You should. Thank you. Yeah, you I, should. I am in the end. It's just, uh, you know, it's it's a learning experience. You learn you learn so much when you do big projects like this. And I mean, that's the that's why I still make stuff and it's why why I hope I always will is like I think yeah the day you stop recognizing that like oh okay well, I'm done I've, I've done it it's perfect you know I think if I ever have that thought then why why would I make anything else for sure <laughs> so for I sure. hope I always hate my work I guess is my point <laughs> fair enough fair enough yeah. and you mentioned the sale Jaden I don't know if we should even talk about that but I believe because we didn't know this at the time your film became an official selection, but that's one of our board members, right? Uh, yeah, that's I learned Glenn. that after, after, afterward. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's always funny to find out after the fact, like Glenn, Glenn, I always send Glenn, Glenn Reynolds, Circus Road Films, is one of our board members, and I always send him a list of our features, because he's interested in that, and uh, he goes... Oh, Kringle Time is one of mine. I'm like, oh, cool, because that's a good movie. I would have wanted you to pick that one up. Yeah, so he's a great guy. Yeah, and he did quick and and good work. He got us a got us a deal, and it's all you yeah, know for sure. If yeah. uh, I, I joke about this, but it's not a joke. Like if I only hear good things about him, and if I if I ever heard someone say Glenn fucked me over, I'd be like, oh damn, I can't like send Glenn that list anymore. <laughs> For real. Though. I don't think you have anything to worry about. Uh, our festival yeah. is not a, uh, a front to help one dude's uh, business. It's the long I con. I swear yeah. to God. <laughs> swear to God. It's just about uh, geeking out over film, really, and bringing people together. So was it a good experience? What? How was, how'd it go? Because uh, I know people who listen to this are often really into the distribution side because, yeah, yeah. you know, indie distribution has been so disrupted by streaming and whatnot that it's, it's a... It's a funky life, so... Yeah. Yeah, it's an interesting... Uh, I would say I'm still learning uh, about that whole process. Um, and it's it's very... It was very interesting to... Uh, you, you know, Glenn has a lot of um, very helpful literature just about the, the process itself, what to expect along the way, um, which, was, which was really helpful. And, I mean, just talking to the companies that end up making offers, you... It's... It's interesting. <laughs> the dynamic is interesting. Um, like a lot of other things in this line of work, you know, you're never really sure what's genuine and what's not. It's a total crapshoot in that regard. Um, you're never like at least in art. So going back to the idea of Kringle Time being a Christmas movie, you know, I think one of the early things they latched onto, uh, you know, but you know, any any company we talked to was like, uh, well, okay, so it's a Christmas movie, right? So that's how we're going to market it. And I'm, and I'm like. Not really, you know. There's a snowman in it, and they, the word Christmas, I think, is in the movie, but like, it's not a Christmas movie. And um, it's it, you learn sort of like what things you ac- decisions you accidentally made end up having like way bigger impact than you <laughs> than you could have ever hoped for. Like even early on when we talked about like, oh, this could be confusing for people that it's a Christmas movie if we have the, the name Kringles in it, whatever. Um, 
we eventually brush it off because we're like, ah, that'll be funny, whatever. People don't care, and we. I don't think we really, you know, dedicated enough brain cells to the to the issue of like, well, okay, but like from a business perspective, someone's going to really latch on to this, and now we're stuck with it. You know, now it's a, now we have to say it's a Christmas movie. <laughs> well, but isn't that? It's I'm fine. Gonna, I'm gonna it's play fine. It. As, as a victimless crime, I suppose. I'm not sure this is devil's advocate, but isn't it actually a good thing? Like a lot of people finish a really good, fun indie film that I, as a programmer of a festival, love, and then they turn to those distributors who distribute indie films, and the distributors look at them and go, "I got no angle to market this." Yeah. Whereas, even if the Christmas connection is false. You still can have a trailer with a snowman in it and promote the shit out of it, right? Like November and December, like, and, like, and that's ultimately where they were coming from. Obviously, was uh, those are the kind of movies that perform perennially. So it's uh, you know more than other types of movies. You know, if if you were, I would say, if you were in this game just as an investment, which would be a stupid thing to do, but if you if you were. Um, you know that wouldn't there were, there would be a dumber idea that you could have than to make a christmas movie or to make like a, a, you know a valentine's day movie something that every year at that time is going to be pushed again so the sequel's cupid time i suppose so yeah. <laughs> no but I, I mean i was going to say like you you talked about brain cells you could flip it around at some point and say we used our brain cells we were really <laughs> smart that even though it's not a christmas movie and it's not set during christmas time there's no there's no Christmas in it at all. This snowman is really a a marketable character. Yeah, yeah. It go, it, you know that probably opens up the discussion of uh, how much of what we do is yeah art versus gloves off creativity, <laughs> and how much of it is uh, a business motivated decision. So yeah, and this was not. Yeah, you didn't make an indie feature thinking that uh, thinking that it was going to buy you a house. No. Yeah, probably prevented me from buying a house. <laughs> <laughs> Which with the amount I, I ended up seeing. I'm going to say, um, see, because actually Glenn and I met at Sundance Slam Dance. I like to give Slam Dance more credit than Love Sundance because yeah. I went to way more <laughs> Slam Dance screenings, and they gave me award thirty years ago. But nice. But uh, they have a new channel out. Yeah, but really a new stream, a new oh, like streaming service. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I'll have to check it out. Absolutely. But uh, we met way back then. Oh man, I lost my train. Oh, of thought. sorry. I, what, I, what I totally were we derailed about? you. No, meeting it's fair. Glenn, uh, business decisions oh, versus creativity. Yeah. yeah, thirty years ago, everyone—not everyone, but like—you went to a film festival, and all the filmmakers were pricks to each other mm. because everyone was like, "Oh, competing!" I'm the next the Kevin yeah, Smith. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm the next Ken Burns. I, I wanna, I want that. You know, I'm gonna take this film to the festival circuit, and I'm gonna get rich. You know, so now that. That myth has been completely <laughs> buried because I don't think the last big thing to come out of Sundance that I can name is like Little Miss Sunshine might have launched some <laughs> careers. Like, and it already had Tony Collette. Like, forget it. Yeah, like, yeah. like, people no longer think that that their indie film with no recognizable actors is going to. Yeah, is yeah. going to. Yeah, you're right. Is going to turn. Is going to. Um, it's a bummer because. It was really cool when every year, you know, the 20, 30 biggest cities in, in America, in North America, would have an, a theater that would play indies. Like, those theaters aren't here. Yeah. Like, even uh, here in L.A., the theater that would, would have been the indie theater, like, they'll have Marvel movies there now. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's, it's a different landscape for indie, for sure. It's yeah. just a bummer. It is. Yeah. Yeah, the... Uh I mean, it's a double-edged sword because it's like the, having that sort of window of uh, romantic indie filmmaker, or whatever, probably was responsible for inspiring like a huge, you know, a whole, a but whole it, bunch of people, yeah. myself included. I'm yeah. going to be cynical though and say it inspired. You were inspired for the right reasons, but a lot of people were inspired for the wrong reasons. Well, I mean, yeah. I knew mofo's in the aughts who were like, they you would meet them. Whether it was a mixer or whether it was just in Los Angeles, like, they, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but, <laughs> but like, I would meet people and they'd be like, oh, I'm a filmmaker. And you'd be like, oh, what are you working on? And they're like, well, I'm not sure, but I really want an oh, office yeah, on yeah. the studio You're lot. Right. Like, their goal was an yeah. office on the studio <laughs> lot. Their goal wasn't even to make a film. Like, That's they didn't smart. even have an idea for a film. They just were like, you know, I'm pretty sure this indie movie thing can get me established. And it's like, dude. 
So now everyone at the festival so is friendlier. Like all, all the filmmakers oh, yeah. who come to our mixers are nice to each other because no one's thinking if you sell yours, I don't get to sell mine. Like, yeah. It is so funny because it because when it, you you think about the indie film you know sort of marketplace and you you almost despair because it's like there's well okay the, the mid range movie has disappeared uh, there's no buyers for, you know, there's too much content out there not enough buyers but you know the, it, we're still in a phase where I think so many different outlets are investing pretty heavily in getting just buying up content and putting it out there you know I think it. it it can be, it can feel sort of daunting and it definitely like looking at the two halves of myself before and after this project, you know, you've I never really thought about getting a distribution deal for Kringle time. Of course, that's in the back of your brain. Like if that happens, if I figure out how the hell to do that, then great, you know, but I'm, I, that's, I don't even, I can't plan for that future because I don't even know how to do it. So what I can plan for is make a movie, right? And, and try to laugh at it as much as I can while I'm making it, try to have a good time, try to be proud of having done it. And then, yeah, I mean, all your skills are focused around yeah. filmmaking, not film selling, right? Not just well, it's not controllable, and that's what I mean. You hear, I think you hear that quite a bit, like people when people talk about what they want, you know. Uh, and it's fine. I mean, it, it's everyone's different how, how you get motivated. I think for me personally, if I had a list of goals and I one was become king of Botswana, you know, I wouldn't know how to start achieving that goal, you know, so it would be a tough one to, to add to my list. So it's like, yeah, have a have a studio office. I mean, I don't know. I don't know how you could possibly plan for that future. You know, with, especially without ideas for how to make stuff. So, like, uh, yeah, just have goals that you can plan to achieve. <laughs> Re- moderately realistic goals are good. Right. We're talking about moder- moderately realistic goals. So now that Kringle Time is out there mm. and people should go to Amazon Prime tonight, if you if you buy it off of iTunes or other VODs, beautiful. But if you got Prime Video on, you know, you got a nice juicy big TV mm-hmm. with... Prime a Prime app built in or Roku or Apple TV, whatever the F. Watch this damn film. Watch it. Because, you know, they will Amazon will give like point oh oh one cents oh, yeah, man. To, to, to your distributor. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe got, in ten years I'm gonna see the first dollar. It's gonna be good. The, the Discover Indie <laughs> Film TV series got up to like ten thousand unique viewers a week. Mm. And that month it was a twenty one dollar. Hey, direct deposit. Now that's more than one beer. No, that's, that's pretty uh, good. Yeah, of course there was seventy five filmmakers to share that twenty one dollars at that point. So, <laughs> but that was a lot of views. Everyone was happy with the views. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So I just want you to have the eyeballs, even though it doesn't. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It just helps Bezos buy another rocket. <laughs> I, apparently, <laughs> we it, can hope. It is funny that like the most famous midlife crisis jillionaire on earth. Is also indirectly related to the fact the the main conduit for indie film is really Prime Video right now. It is wild, and it has uh, it has definitely changed since I started getting involved with it. The uh, yeah. I feels it feels like every two or three months they send out another, you know, you know we're cutting your share by another half, you know. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't fun. even know how low the royalty is. I don't now. know. I stopped looking at a certain point. I know it was, and I don't get the statements on. I get the statements on uh, on um, Moonshot because I put it on there, but uh, right. I don't get it on Kringle Times. So I have no idea. <laughs> I yeah, have no idea yeah. what our viewership is. And fair enough. I mean, yeah. it's it's it is what it is. I know, and Netflix, and no other streaming service has really stepped up. Um, yeah, because I remember Netflix ten years ago was like we would just like search all the indie films on there and find stuff we'd never heard of and watch it and like. Boy, they went. That was pre-original content. Now that they have original content, they yeah. are not interested in promoting anything but their own stuff. Yeah. So, the good news is you can still pitch to those companies with a completed film and have it become original content. Yeah, yeah. They can grab it. And make they can it grab exclusive. it and be like, now it's an Amazon original yeah. or whatever. You know, even though yeah. they came in at the last possible second. You know? Right. <laughs> So as in the world of realistic goals that we were talking about, but have some unrealistic ones too, please. But uh, so what's what's next for you? Well, like I said, I'm always writing. Um, been working on this uh, new feature script now for, yeah, close in April. It'll be a full year. Um, yeah, I don't want to jinx it by giving too much. No, you don't have to share anything. But, 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 but you... But you 
This is actually good news. Odd clap. That uh, you made a feature and you want to make another. <laughs> it's a not every, come not around everyone there. does. Yeah, you're right. Um, and in fact, had you asked me, yeah, a year after making Crinkle Time, you know, do you ever want to be on set again? I'd be like, well, no, no, thanks. I'm really? So, 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 so at the now. Mexican restaurant, the outdoor patio uh, <laughs> mixer last yeah, June, if I'd said, very well been my when's funeral? your next yeah. film, Matt? You would have leaned over and said, I don't know if I'm ever going to fucking do this <laughs> <You're> again. <right. laughs> exactly. Yeah. No, it, it eats, it eats you up. If you, well, you know, it, it doesn't have to, it, it's, it's so hard to talk with, um, you know, people, people ask for advice or like I've taught some class, taught a class with the Sundance Institute, um, several months ago now uh, with a bunch of f- f- first time directors who were about to start their first features. And so I was able to kind of talk with them about my very recent experience going through that. And um, yeah, I think it's hard, honestly, to, to say like what works and what doesn't, even though I know what worked for me and what didn't work for me. Cause people can, you know, Kringle time for all its low budgetness was pretty, the scope, the, you know, the, the we, we were reaching for the stars a little bit. We were right outside the capabilities of what we could possibly do in terms of, like, using that location to double for as many locations as possible. Uh, uh, huge cast, like a way too big cast. Like, we were quite, quite really near the end cast. of what we yeah, yeah. too big. <laughs> well, you're yeah. saying too big, but it definitely makes it feel like a bigger film. Yeah. But that's not, so my point is not everybody has to do, uh, some people are going to be happy not making a movie like that and going out and hand-holding a, a more, like, verite-style you know, like a waiting for Guffman style, almost documentary, uh, like mockumentary fictional thing. Like if you did something like that and you were pretty well prepared for it, I could see the production not taking your life, you know, but it, <laughs> it, uh, it quite nearly sapped me dry. Yeah. I'm not you sure know. you can make an indie film without it, uh, at least dominating three to six months of your life where you, yeah. you literally don't get to, well, you hear uh, all stories, man. You hear like, I, I, um, recently a friend of mine, uh, made his first feature as well. And I did a set visit, um, on his production. It, whole, crew was happy. Cast was happy. Everybody's cool. It was like day nine of 10. It was a 10 day shoot. Like that's impossible to me. Like, I don't mean, I couldn't even describe to you how to achieve something like that. And he was happy as can be. He didn't look like he was stressed out. He was having time in his life. Everybody was, I was like, man, you guys are on next level chill. Cause <laughs> I would be freaking out. Uh, but you know, different strokes, I guess. It's interesting. I'm always, uh, not jealous, but I want, I'll just use the word jealous. Anyway, I'm jealous of youth because like when you're young, you can kind of get the group of friends together that can like do something like, one Saturday a month for like eight months and like just spread it out. Like yeah. everyone stays devoted. No one, no one drifts off. Like, like that's a very cool way to do it. I think, I think a lot of films I really like, I find out they're like, yeah, we just did it, you know, every weekend for like, you know, four or five months when we had to take a weekend off, we did. And it's like, you, that's impossible to hold together once people oh, yeah. have lives. Couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, I have so much respect uh, for people yeah. that can. Yeah. Yeah, if you have a life and a job, that's out. One of my problems is like, partner. <laughs> I have trouble not focusing on a thing once it's started. So like, I, it, it was like it would be so schizophrenic to me to to jump in for a weekend and then take a week off and come back. Like, I don't, I wouldn't know how to move on mentally. I think after Sunday, you know, and then what? I work all day, like all week. I, I couldn't do it. <laughs> it'd be it'd be a lot. Yeah, I guess I should ask as a, as a I I won't. I bias your answer by saying, as a native Evangelino, how do you like? How do you like it? You're how do you like? Uh, oh, I love it. Yeah. Oh, excellent. I love it. Yeah. And I, um, you know, I'd worked here a lot um, over the years, and uh, my sister used to live here, so I've definitely been around. And never, LA was never a city that I came to and was like, yeah, I could live here. I never, I never really felt that way. Um, East Coast, my whole life, so I kind of the the speed is so different out here. You know, just kind of felt. I was too uptight, I think, is my, my issue. But uh, moving out here, um, no, it's like, uh, especially during the pandemic has been uh, really helpful mentally. You know, to be, had we been locked in in the winter of 2020, uh, I, don't, I don't know what, like, I don't know what I would have done, like, un- buried in snow, you know, in, on the East Coast. I don't know what I... I was already this close to losing it. I think I would have absolutely snapped if I was buried in snow that whole time. So being out here, be able to go on a hike and, and go to the beach and do all the things that you do, uh, huge emotional boon, I would say. Excellent. 
but yeah, now that things are kind of opening up, I'm actually getting to you know get get some favorite spots out in the city and actually learn my way around. So very cool. So far, so good. Well, I'm glad you're here. Yeah, thank you. And uh, should we? I guess we're close to wrap up. Do you want to mention? Do you have a uh, social media or websites or how people find you and your work? Um, yeah, I'm I'm absolutely terrible at social media. I do exist uh, on on Instagram at uh, mattlucas.mov. So you can find me there. Um, yeah, that's probably where I would announce any new projects and stuff like that. My website is matthewlucas.co. Uh, so all my sort of catalogs on there. Um, LinkedIn, you know. CO, that's uh, Columbia? No, no. Com was taken, so CO was the next one. <laughs> Clever enough. I know, I'm dot me. I won't say. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> but cool. And, uh, and of course, Kringle Time can be viewed on Prime, but anywhere, anywhere yeah, people... all the major uh, streamers have it to rent, and then it's free on Prime. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, I will do my closing spiel. Um, thank you, Matt, for coming in. And I mentioned Film Invasion Los Angeles, so where you pulled in some awards. So I'll start with that. Film Invasion LA will hold every June here in Los Angeles. And if you want to learn more about it, filminvasionla.com. And it's at Film Invasion LA on social media. And there's a sister festival, Sherman Oaks Film Festival. So that's Sherman, that's every November. And it's shermanoaksff.com. And it's at shermanoaksff on social media. And uh, I did mention the TV series that was born out of this podcast. That was just because feature filmmakers like Matt would tell me I'm on streaming. And everyone who made a short was like, uh, I'm not anywhere. I'm on, I'm, you know, I'm on Vimeo and my, my friends and family watched it. So we threw together an anthology of all the best shorts from the festival circuit and called it Discover Indie Film. So if you go to Prime Video, it used to be included with Prime. It is not anymore because there was something called the Indie Purge. So uh, when we got up to 10,000 viewers a week, we got an email saying, well, I don't know, Amazon is a wonderful platform and it's wonderful to be able to get out to people, but they decided we couldn't be included with Prime anymore, which is funny because you'd think once you're at like 10,000 a week, they'd let you grow more and be a draw. But anyway, you got to pay for it. But think about it this way. When you pay $7.99, for 10 episodes of a TV series and you're supporting about 20, 25 indie filmmakers by doing so. Like someone said, like that's like, it's like a coffee. So a coffee to watch 25 films, it's worth it. I'm just saying it's worth it. And if you want to be nice and you're still listening, give uh, that TV series five stars, give this podcast five stars, like, subscribe, this, that. And by the way, go to amazon.com and go to the prime section and go to Kringle time. Give Kringle motherfucking five stars kringle time with a k five stars because you're not going to see a dark snowman comedy as good as kringle time you're just not going to see it so give it reviews and it's you know it's legitimately four and a half so you're really only lying for that extra half star so you're only it's and you're not really lying at all give it five an angel will get its wings i can guarantee that an angel will get its wings and i mean you know Save save your bitchy internet troll shit for for Disney Marvel World and and <laughs> that's right. But uh, it is always funny to me when like people like I'll read a review like a friend will say like you know or a filmmaker will be like look at these reviews and I'm like and people are like shitting on a film that had like a ten thousand dollar budget and they're like. It feels kind of small, and it's like you're watching an indie film. I, I want to put it on a T-shirt. There's someone that on Amazon reviewed Moonshot, which was my graduate student thesis film that I spent, you know, whatever m- bus money I had in my pocket on. Um, someone wrote, <laughs> even free, this is disgusting. <laughs> it's, the, it's the most salient review of uh, well, one shot you could, uh, you could muster. Well, that doesn't sound right to me at all. <laughs> it's disgusting. Well, uh, uh, kudos to you, Matt, that you can enjoy such cruelty that you just <laughs> laugh at it instead of let it bother you because uh, what are you going to do? Oh, yeah, what are no. you going to do? The, the trolls exist and some people, yeah, shit someone will never say to anyone's face. Shit, oh, yeah. they, no, shit they don't even mean. It's great. They'll they'll put <laughs> online. Of course, I think the worst is the IMDb reviews, right? People are even oh, worse on are, there. Those are pretty bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I I got to get an intern because yeah. I don't. Have, 
I, I keep telling myself, I want to I want to give everyone a good review on IMDb of all the films that are in the festival. But there's like 50, 60 every festival. I don't, I don't have that bandwidth. Yeah. No. I need a I need a college kid. I can also, just say. Does it mean anything? You know, it means nothing. Yeah. But it makes people feel better. I guess it. You know, some of some of the streamers pull in the data from IMDb. So if someone bombs your reviews, then I, I guess like on the listing, you know, when you're scrolling through, it's going to be like, oh, this is rated one star. I'm not watching that. Funny side note that I shouldn't bother sharing, but a film I was involved in in 90, 99, 2000, uh, got this horrible review on IMDb before it even came out. And we looked into it. And it turns out the person who reviewed it had been at a festival and lost an award to us. And then you looked and they had written one 10 star review of their own film. And then all the other films that were at the festival that this person got nothing at got one star reviews. I actually sent an email to support of IMDb at the time. And they and just said, look, this person shit on nine features, gave a 10 to their own work. And, uh, you know, that seems unfair. And they removed all the reviews. Oh, great. I know. Felt like a huge victory. That is huge because that's the most petty bullshit I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To go home from a festival and be like, oh, man, I didn't win Best Dude, Comedy. Yeah. I would venture that person's probably not doing too much. Uh, David anymore. Fincher. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I just threw that name out because uh, he would have never made a comedy anyway. <laughs> All right, well, I guess we can wrap this up, and uh, I'll call you Matthew to close it out, because that's your that's your uh, professional name. Matthew Lucas, writer-director, thank you for coming in. Thank you, Jeff. And I will thank everyone for listening. Yeah.